there should be like a, a okay. recording button. Okay, I, I got it. Thank you. Super. Okay, amazing. Anything else you wanted to touch base on before we jump in? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Perfect. Amazing. So I'm wondering if you could start by just briefly introducing yourself and sharing a bit about your background. Mm -hmm. Where did you grow up and were you raised in a particular religious or spiritual tradition? Okay. Um, my name is Bonnie Violet Quintana um, and I am a <coughs> trans, femme, genderqueer, spiritual drag artist and digital chaplain. And I grew up in a little town called Wendell in Idaho, population 3,000. It wow. was it was 3,040 years ago and it's still 3,000 now. Let me turn that off. Um, and um, I grew up in that little town to a family that were not church going folk. Um, but my, my aunt uh, took me to church when I was really young, I think like five or six. And um, I loved it. And so I really got into church and um, was a Jesus freak, loved Jesus, loved, uh, you know, bringing people to Jesus or whatever. Um, and it was like a safe place for me. I would say in my family, it was the first queer thing I did was go to wow. church. And uh, go ahead. I was just going to interject and ask, do you remember anything about that church, if it had a denomination or what size it was, and yeah. things like that? The very first church I went to was a free, a free, three, free, three Methodist. I think it was a free mm -hmm. Methodist church. Okay. Um, and my aunt had just taken me to that when I was young. I would say I don't remember a lot of my childhood because trauma, but... Sure. Um, <laughs> But uh, I did go. I did go to that church, and I have more fond. Mem I have more memories from when I was like more of like a teenager, and I okay. went to Hagerman, Idaho, which is a town about ten miles away, where I went to a non-denominational Christian center. Got it. Okay, great. Sorry, you can uh, keep going. Um, is there anything else you wanted to share at this point about your background? Um, I'm trying to think. I, I don't know. I don't know what's interesting to you. <laughs> so, well, I, I was interested when you said that you experienced church as maybe one of the first queer spaces. Can mm -hmm. you say more about that? What was queer about church for you at that age? Well, I think the queerness was just in the sense it was very much outside of the norm of my mm -hmm. family and mm -hmm. the people that I grew up with, if that makes sense. So it was queer in that sense of me being outside of my social norms or family norms that sort of thing so but as far as like the church itself being queer as in like lgbtq or anything like that um mm -hmm. i wouldn't say that um but i would yeah i wouldn't say that okay no that's a great distinction okay so i'd love to hear more about your journey to becoming a chaplain mm -hmm. um it sounds like you had a love for church at least this version of church at a young age how did you go from being in this space to uh, to becoming a chaplain oh that was a long journey <laughs> um <laughs> okay. feel free to only share whatever you want to share about that journey yeah That's yeah right. yeah no i mean i think kind of the cliff notes if you will or the milestones is you know when i graduated high school um i moved out to phoenix arizona um, where I went to school to be an architect, an actor, a model, and a preacher. <laughs> um, <Wow>. All within <laughs> a short, very short amount of time. And, you know, as young people, we're, always, we're often trying to figure out what it is that we want to do and be. And I had gotten a calling after going to architecture school and acting and modeling stuff. And I felt the call to work with young people um, in churches with theater specifically as the tool um, cause that's what I had gotten to do when I was, um, at that little church here in Idaho, we did, we did theater productions and I thought that was just really cool. And so when I moved out to Phoenix, Arizona, I got involved with a mega church out there. It was mega, like it was huge compared. I mean, like, I think our, sometimes the congregation was like 
you know, a thousand to two thousand people, you know, which was <laughs> almost like my hometown. So it was a right. huge, <laughs> it was a huge um, shift for me. But um, I really, I loved it a lot. Um, I, I loved it a lot. It was just kind of like you know, as I was moving to a new city and doing all that. My aunt was a Christian who was very involved. Like the aunt that took me to church is the aunt I moved to Phoenix to live with as well. Got it. Um, and so. Um, I was really kind of into that. I think I was really shy and I, I really struggled. I remember it was kind of random, but one of the roles I had to play was this uh, very like masculine kind of macho kind of person like Tim Allen from Home Improvement. And oh I struggled really bad, <laughs> um, but I, I tried. <laughs> um, and so <laughs> anyways, um, uh, in a very short amount of time when I was uh, 20 years old, um, I had been, I was diagnosed with HIV and I just barely turned 20 and that caused me to really, um, it pushed me kind of out of the closet in a lot of ways as a queer person. Um, I hadn't shared that at church. Um, I had actually left Grand Canyon University uh, to be a pastor because I'd kind of started to feel like things weren't aligning <laughs> anymore uh, with my life and who I was and, and kind of being in that sort of environment. Um, sure. And so I was kind of exploring and figuring out what it meant to be a queer person on my own. And then that's when I found out that I was um, HIV positive the first time I ever got tested. And that really was one of the big things that kind of pushed me out of the church and away from religion. Um, I did not feel like I could go to my community to go to my church and tell them what was really going on with me. And it was a very scary and difficult time for me. And I couldn't, it was the first time in my life that I couldn't go to church. And I, I guess I couldn't, I guess the God thing was something that I just didn't have the capacity for in the sense of, I felt like God loved me anyway. Um, that's the key loved me anyway I wasn't sure why or how um, and so because I couldn't quite um, I guess come to that understanding on my own I just kind of put God on a shelf and lived my life um, thinking maybe one day um, you know I might I might be able to go back there um, and then I would say like the queer community um, and the club scene and um, drugs and alcohol and all that sort of stuff became my new church, my new religion, and my new safe space. Um, uh, it was such a gift in a lot of ways to kind of be thrusted into this queer group of people um, who loved being queer and lived mm -hmm. out loud as queer folk for the most part. And I didn't know how, I mean, I remember I had just got a job at a gay bar to learn how to be gay because I didn't grow up around gay people or queer people. I didn't see them on TV. I didn't see them in town. I didn't, you know, like there, it was like they were an invisible community for me growing up. We didn't talk about it in church. I don't recall people being hateful <laughs> to queer people. Sure. I just, we were just very much invisible. Um, right. So, which I think in some ways was almost just as harmful. I don't know. Yeah. That just wasn't my experience, so. So then how did you go from being in this sort of new religious space, you know, this, mm -hmm. this new spirituality, you're sort of finding, like you said, your new form of spirituality. How did you go from being there to actually becoming a chaplain? What's, what chaplaincy look like for you? Yeah. Um, well, um, so, <laughs> yeah, years down the, way, down the road, you know, I kind of, you know, I ended up moving back to Idaho when I was 21 because I was having really major health problems and I had to go, I had to get into care and I needed to live with my parents. So I moved back in with my parents at 21. And then um, at 24 years old, I started a nonprofit and HIV AIDS organization in Idaho, where we just tried to create a space where normal people, well, as normal as I was and my friends were, um, could um, do something about the HIV epidemic um, in our community in Idaho because there wasn't any yeah. sort of organization or anything like that. And there definitely wasn't a space for just like community folk to like do something. And so I did that for about 10 years and 
about the last three years of that, I um, I got sober. Um, I ended up getting uh, sober from drugs and alcohol. I had a, you know, in the beginning, drugs and alcohol were really helpful and useful, and they softened the blow of life. Um, but eventually, they made life a little bit more difficult. Um, I felt like I had reached the point of life that I could do with substances being a part of that, and I had to find a way to let go. And that's when I met queer people who talked about God and had a reliance on God that I had never had before. Um, and I was just perplexed and confused and in awe and just like deeply desired that, I think more than me even not wanting to use substances. Like I had missed and really wanted to have that spiritual way of life again and to really connect more intentionally to my purpose and I guess mattering in some ways um, and so which is weird because my life had already been doing all that it just wasn't wrapped or threaded in a spiritual way mm -hmm. and that came in time um, that where I could begin to lace my narrative my entire narrative with a spiritual thread even when I wasn't going to church or actively seeking God. I would say that was actually when I first fell into grace because so much of my life before that I was trying to do everything I needed to do to be right and correct in order to please God. Um, and when I just had to like let go and let God be God and me just try to be okay, I think that's when I really fell into grace and really began to understand what that meant. That, you know, value and worth without earning it um and so yeah so in recovery that's when I started getting open up to this idea of God again it wasn't the God that I grew up in church I really had a hard time being in churches for a while it was very I was very traumatized um yeah. and it was very difficult for me I ended up landing in a um a United Methodist Church in Chicago which I had moved to Chicago after running the HIV AIDS organization and I landed in an, a church because I was uh, setting up HIV testing center within their church. And I got stuck <laughs> sitting through the sermon that day. Oh. And it was a queer person who was a drug addict in recovery talking about their relationship with God. And I just was like, it was like one of those moments where I felt like it was all just for me. Like mm -hmm. everything aligned in a way that was like, all right, girl, this is this is where you're meant to be and everything that's happening right now is set up for you, which I know sounds really whatever, but that's like the way that it felt in that moment. Like I was exactly where I needed to be to hear what I needed to be. And I cried the whole sermon next to this stranger. <laughs> um, and I found myself going to that church every week after that for probably a year or more. And I cried every Sunday and it was one of the things that I did no matter what. And I don't know why, but it just was so important for me to go there and be celebrated and seen in the fullness of, and my queerness, um, surrounded by old people and young people and like people who look like, like it looked a lot like the church that I grew up in as far as the people there. Um, it was important for me that I was in a church that wasn't just a bunch of queer people. Um, I think in order to feel like it was authentic or close enough to what I was raised in, I guess. Um, and that is where I eventually um, ended up doing a chaplain training after the death of my nephew. Um, he had died in my arms and I, I, I ended up being like the queer person in between my brother and his Mormon wife's family. And then my family, which, you know, people died and you threw a party and got tattoos. <laughs> so I was kind of, I found myself in the in-between of uh, the both families and the many different ways of expressing grief and loss. And it, in some ways I never felt, it was one of the first times I could just let go and let God. I practiced be still and know, and I just was like, I do not know what the best result for this little boy is right now. So I'm just gonna show up for the people around me and do what needs to be done. Um, and after having that experience of like, holding him as the usher, singing at his funeral in the Mormon 
temple, you know, adjacent to the temple and just like all these sorts of things. I was just like, I want this back again. Like I want mm. to be back into this idea of intentionally spiritual kind of mission or work, if you will. Um, but with queer.